That again. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome, and uh, we are about to begin meeting number 13 of the Toronto Accessibility Advisory Committee. Um, we are going live. So, hello, everyone. My name is Councillor Kristen Wong Tam. The clerks have confirmed that we have quorum. Uh, I'd like to call meeting 13 of the Toronto Accessibility Advisory Committee uh, to order and say hello and welcome to everybody. Uh, this meeting is being held using the city's WebEx technology with members and staff connecting by video conference or calling in. We ask for your patience with any delays and technical issues. Members of the public can observe the meeting on YouTube. We are also providing captioning for this meeting and we want to say thank you to our CART captioner. Uh, there are a few reminders that I have to provide. Uh, staff. Please keep your video turned off until you need to speak or answer questions. Uh, this makes it easier for myself as chair and for those watching on YouTube to observe members as they participate in the debate of each item and during votes. Members and staff, please keep your microphones on mute unless you need to answer a question or to speak. Uh, members, if you wish to speak uh, on an item and if you, and if you do, uh, please have your video on and if you are able to, please raise your hand and unmute your microphone. Let me know and I will create a speaker's list to acknowledge you. When voting, if you can, have your video on and if you are able to, raise your hand or unmute your microphone to indicate your vote. Uh, if you have motions, please submit them in writing to the clerk. The clerk staff are available by email to support you at taac at toronto.ca. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that although we are meeting in different locations and meeting remotely today, the committee would like to acknowledge that the land we're meeting on is traditional territories of many nations, uh, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat people. And Toronto is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. Um, so thank you very much for uh, your participation, your attendance today. Um, I want to just um, begin our meeting, uh, and this actually brings um, me no joy. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm quite uh, heartbroken to, to announce, and many of you are already aware, uh, that we had a valuable member of our committee who passed away. Um, and, uh, and that person, of course, is Michael Masili. Uh, he spent a lot of time in our committee. I know each and every single one of you enjoyed working with him. Uh, I certainly did. He kept us very busy and on our toes with a number of, uh, of motions which he initiated, but he always kept us um, going. And I think that um, uh, his, his passing um, is, a, is a significant loss, uh, not just to this community um, and, uh, and just not necessarily to the Toronto uh, uh, community at large, uh, but I know that he'll be missed by family and friends dearly, uh, as I will also miss him. Um, I just want to uh, take a moment uh, with all of the members today, um, and if you can join me in just a moment of silence, as we remember very fondly uh, Michael and uh, think about him uh, in our personal interactions with him. Uh, think about him as he uh, moved motions and, and pushed us forward as a committee to do more. Um, and, uh, and think about him and know that his spirit is with us uh, and that we will carry on his work. Um, so please join me in that moment of silence, please. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, and uh, I don't know if at this point in time there are other members who uh, would like to say a few words about Michael. Um, and, uh, and if that is the case, uh, you, I just want to open up the floor and give you that opportunity as well. Uh, and of course, um, you know, you can also hold those words to yourself. And uh, I know that you all miss him and, uh, and value his contributions. Um, but I did want to make sure that opportunity was available. 
Uh, if those who wish to speak, um, to share their thoughts, their reflections, please raise your hand uh, or unmute your microphone. Uh, I'm going to start with Wendy, please, and then followed by Liv. Go ahead, Wendy. Thank you, Councillor Wong Tam. Um, Michael is missed by so many people, and I wanted to say on behalf of the Center for Independent Living in Toronto, Michael was a member of SILT for many years and uh, came out to many, many of our peer-based events. And um, we were just talking about him this morning at our, our SILT staff meeting, how much we miss him. There's a tribute posted to Michael on the SILT website, if people would like to have a look at that. There is also a, an opportunity, there is an online, um, I think connected to um, a memorial for Michael where people could put messages about their memories of him. But for me, um, I loved coming to the TAC meeting and being able to sit with Michael and have a bit of a chin wag, you know, and a bit of a strategy session before we got started. And I certainly I admired Michael very much. I thought he was one of the kindest, most genuine people that I've had the pleasure to know. And I, um, I'm very sad that we've lost him, but I'm also very confident in the this committee that we will be able to continue to uh, push the work that Michael was uh, working so hard at as well. And I think you know if we if we continue to do our work in that spirit, we honor Michael's memory too. So thank you. Thank you so much, Wendy. Um, Liv, please go ahead. So well said, Wendy. Um, Michael was um, a tremendous activist, but he was also a great mentor. And I just want to note, uh, when I first joined this committee, um, Michael is the one um, who really encouraged everyone to be confident, be bold, not be afraid to ask tough questions, not be afraid to raise motions, um, and really made it all seem much more doable. And um, I know he's missed by by so many, um, and I know all of our condolences go out to his close friends and family. Um, he absolutely um, was a, a stalwart in in the disability rights world, and um, we will carry on as he no doubt would expect us to, and and would be holding our feet to the fire if he was here. So we will continue to do so. Thank you so much, Liv. Um, if I can get the grid back on the screen. Uh, any other members who would like to speak? If not, uh, thank you so much, uh, everyone. Um, and uh, just uh, by, by way of record, um, I did submit a member of, uh, of condolence uh, to City Council. So City Council will be conveying its uh, condolences and regrets to the family. Okay, let's, uh, let's proceed with the rest of the agenda. Um, thank you, sir, very much, everybody. Uh, are there any declarations of interest under the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act? And if you do have an interest, please unmute your microphone and let me know. Okay. Seeing none, thank you. Uh, we, next, we need, to, uh, we need to have a motion to confirm the minutes from our last meeting on November the 20th and December the 1st. Um, uh, so moved by Glenn. Uh, any opposed? All those in favor? Thank you very much. That carries. Um, let's review the agenda. There are four items on the agenda, and I see that no one is asking for the addition of new businesses, a new business. Uh, so let's consider those items in its according order. Uh, the first item is DI 13.1, the chair's report, and I will hold to speak to that very briefly. Uh, DI 13.2. Uh, and this is, uh, we will receive a presentation from staff. There's an overnight snow clearing on commercial properties, um, and we will be receiving that presentation shortly. Um, item number three is DI 13.3, CAFE TO 2021 Accessibility Feedback. Uh, we will, again, hold that item for staff presentation. Item number four is our last item, uh, is DI 13.4, vacancy on the Toronto Accessibility Advisory Committee. Uh, members, there is a letter from the interim city clerk for information uh, that notes that there are at least two vacancies on this committee. Um, we could proceed to uh, advance this item very quickly if there's no uh, questions. Uh, and I'm just looking to you if you want to hold this item down for debate or we can just ad adopt it. Okay, I think... 
Yes, oh sorry, to receive for information, thank you. Uh, Carol is making sure I stay on track. Uh, so if there's no questions of staff and you do not wish to speak, uh, then uh, I can move this item for, uh, for receipt for information. All those in favor, please indicate your support. And any opposed, seeing none, that carries. Okay, so let's head back to the top of the agenda. Um, and uh, I do have the chair's report. I've tabled it uh, for you. Uh, it would have been part of your agenda. Uh, and uh, I'm just going to highlight a few things. Obviously, uh, we did acknowledge the passing of Michael Masili, um, but also other things of note. Um, Young Tomorrow, which uh, many of you may have seen, has been adopted by City Council. Um, I want to just say thank you to TAC, your endorsement uh, for the recommendations to, to City Council and to staff uh, gave the Transportation Service staff a lot of confidence and to know that they valued uh, your input. So I want to share that success because you were part of our, our pathway to, uh, uh, to making that a real project. Um, and of course, construction will begin uh, in 2023. Um, I want to just recognize at least uh, two items which I believe I want to highlight for you. One is equity responsive uh, budgeting at the City of Toronto. We have heard, of course, from Sarah Blackstock in the past. Uh, City Council will be voting on its budget on February the 18th. It's a special meeting where uh, all we talk about is the budget, um, and we are expected to pass the rate supported operating and tax um, and the capital budget for 2021. Uh, as many of you know, it's a very difficult budget, um, but I think that TAC has made its voice uh, very clear that any uh, budget considerations must uh, have an equity lens uh, and that our encouragement to staff to in continue uh, to pursue uh, equity responsive budgeting uh, is going to be embedded in some of that work. I think we can all recognize that we're not there yet. Um, but uh, we also know it's a very um, important tool that will be developed and hopefully um, provided with greater, uh, allowed to have greater influence over the budget in the future moving forward. Um, and that's the portion around equity responsive budgeting. Um, and this one is uh, uh, clearing the path towards a safe and accessible winter. Um, I know many of you um, have expressed concerns to me as the chair um, or just even as, as a colleague and friend. Uh, why is the City of Toronto not clearing pathways uh, along sidewalks, around trails? Um, we don't have a, I would say, we don't have a satisfactory answer. I'm certainly not satisfied uh, with the answer that staff have provided so far. Um, but I also want to acknowledge that staff are doing everything they can, knowing that council, I believe, as a whole, is very interested in harmonizing snow removal uh, for the old city of Toronto as well as the new amalgamated city. Uh, and that remains a pursuit course. Uh, and, uh, and that also uh, means that those pilot project areas this year that came into effect, um, we haven't seen too much snow, but when we have, um, the snow hasn't necessarily stayed on the ground for too long. But I know that uh, what we'd like to do is build on the success of the pilot project and hopefully expand it across the city. Um, so those items will most likely come back, uh, at least those two items, and there are others that will come back to TAC, uh, and we will have another chance at informing the process and improving the work that staff are building upon. Um, I'm going to just end my uh, chair's report there. Uh, are there any uh, questions or perhaps comments to the chair's report? Okay, uh, seeing none, then I would uh, ask if someone would like to move the chair's report received for information. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Wendy. I saw your hand go first. Uh, anyone opposed? And that carries. Thank you very much, folks. Okay, so we're heading into item number two, uh, overnight snow clearing on commercial properties. We're, we're definitely on, uh, on the right theme. Um, I want to welcome uh, Jessica Stanley, who's a Senior Policy and Research Officer for Municipal Licensing and Standard, to give us an overview and a presentation on overnight uh, snow clearing on commercial properties. Uh, she's here to provide us information, but also she's looking to receive feedback from our committee. Uh, Jessica, are you on the line? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, you're, you're just a, your audio is just a little bit soft, so if you can lean into your microphone, maybe we can hear you a little bit better. Okay. Is this better if I hold it out? Uh, yes, if you hold it up, it's definitely much better. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Thanks. Um, so, hi, everyone. Um, I'm just wondering if Clerks is going to share the presentation. Perfect. 
Thank you so much. Um, so hi, everyone, and thank you for the opportunity to present to you today. Uh, my name is Jessica Stanley, and I am a Senior Policy and Research Officer in the Municipal Licensing and Standards Division. I'm also the Policy Lead on the Noise Bylaw, and today I'm here to talk about overnight snow clearing on commercial properties. Next slide. So the purpose of today's presentation is to inform TAC members of a directive that staff received from the Infrastructure and Environment Committee to provide an overview of current regulations and key issues in relation to noise and snow clearing, to present the preliminary staff recommendation, and to seek your input on this issue. Next slide. So last year, just prior to the onset of the pandemic, staff received direction from the Infrastructure and Environment Committee to report back on the feasibility of prohibiting snow clearing activity within commercial properties that are located 100 meters or less from residential areas between midnight and 6 a.m. This directive is a response to resident concerns about noise from overnight snow clearing in a commercial plaza. These are our ongoing response and recovery efforts. We were unable to report back by the September 2020 meeting as originally requested. We've since been asked to report in March. Next slide. So just as background, in Toronto, snow clearing is regulated under two municipal code chapters. The first one is chapter 719, snow and ice removal, which requires that snow and ice be removed from city sidewalks by building owners and occupants within 12 hours of the snowfall. Chapter 629 property standards requires that snow and ice be cleared from steps, landings, walks, driveways, and parking spaces on private property within 24 hours. So both chapters require the removal of snow and ice by time constraints to provide safe and uninterrupted uh, access and egress. The noise bylaw, uh, chapter 591 noise, does not regulate snow and ice clearing activity or equipment to ensure that there's adherence to these two Toronto Municipal Code chapters. So in addition to the Toronto Municipal Code, uh, under provincial legislation, the City of Toronto must maintain minimum maintenance standards for the public right of way, including the removal of snow and ice. And again, this is to ensure the safe passage of residents. The Municipal Act and the City of Toronto Act provide that a municipality must keep its highways in a state of repair that is reasonable in the circumstances. Furthermore, Ontario Regulation 239, made under the Act, outlines that further maintenance standards um, are required specific to winter activity. Next slide. So in addition to legal requirements, there are key reasons for permitting overnight snow clearing. And the first is with re respect to accessibility, and that's why I'm here today. Um, so as you know, in 2019, City Council adopted a multi-year accessibility plan. The plan outlines outcomes and initiatives that re reaffirm the City of Toronto's commitment to an accessible city and to building an equitable and inclusive society that values the contributions of people with disabilities. Timely snow and ice clearing is essential to the daily living needs of Torontonians who may be unsteady, use mobility aids and devices, rely on a service animal, use strollers, etc. People with disabilities frequent commercial properties both as customers and as employees. So impeded access has potential implications for the independence, employment, and livelihood of people with disabilities. Next slide. Staff are specifically concerned that the committee directive conflicts with the multi-year accessibility plan, specifically initiative 55 of the plan. This initiative directs transportation services to conduct a review of snow clearing policies, practices, and procedures using an accessibility and equity analysis, and to develop a strategy to reduce barriers that significantly limit the mobility of people with disabilities. Transportation Services has introduced several programs to meet this initiative, including a snow clearing program for seniors and persons with disabilities, and a sidewalk snow clearing trial in areas of the city that do not receive mechanical snow clearing. Next slide. In addition to accessibility, another key issue area is safety. Due to provincial requirements and the city's own service levels, 
snow and ice clearing occurs at any time of day. The city meets provincial obligations to clear snow and ice on the public right of way by delivering a winter operations program with 24 hour patrolling. Council approved service levels for winter maintenance often meet or exceed the city's bylaw requirements and the province's maintenance standards. This is because the most practical time to clear snow and ice from property is generally overnight or early morning when areas are free of people and vehicles. Next slide. Lastly, staff are concerned that the directive may effectively ban overnight snow clearing throughout the city. Although there is no clear definition of commercial property, um, this means it could include retail establishments, medical facilities, condominiums, etc. Due to the very design of Toronto, most commercial properties are in close proximity to residential areas, and in many cases, both uses are permitted in the same area. Next slide. As a result of these key issues and the relevant regulations, staff recommend against prohibiting snow clearing overnight within commercial properties located 100 meters or less from residential areas. The noise bylaw exempts snow and ice clearing for safety and accessibility reasons. It is important that the bylaw aligns with and does not conflict with municipal bylaws, provincial legislation, and the city's multi-year accessibility plan. Next. While staff recommend against this directive, we are cognizant of the fact that there are noise concerns. When MLS receives noise complaints about snow clearing, a key component of our compliance approach is education. This includes informing residents of the exemption for snow clearing and connecting with parties involved in a complaint to determine if there is a reasonable solution. Beyond education, mediation is another uh, tool that's available to us. It's particularly useful when there's no further action that a bylaw enforcement officer can take. In 2018, a mediation referral program was established between the city and a community partner. The program is free both for the city and for participants. If complainants do not wish to pursue mediation, then they may also pursue the matter civilly through the courts. Next slide. So just to conclude, I just wanted to highlight that any feedback heard today will be incorporated into a staff report. The report is expected at the March 23rd meeting of the Infrastructure and Environment Committee. Reports are posted five business days before the committee date, so it should be expected on March 16th. You may also submit comments or requests to speak at the committee meeting, and you can visit the Have Your Say website for more information. Last slide. Uh, so thank you and look forward to uh, any feedback you have. Jessica, um, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I'm just going to now turn over the floor to the members to see if any of them have questions. Uh, if you have a question, if you can indicate by raising your hand or unmuting your microphone, then I can acknowledge you. I'm not seeing anyone right now. Uh, maybe I can lean into this one, Jessica. Um, when it comes to commercial properties and snow and ice clearing, um, I believe that because the, the property owner is, pro is responsible for, uh, for the clearing of the snow and the ice, um, there are many properties now, especially commercial properties that are boarded up, uh, because they have, uh, they're no longer in operation. So in downtown Toronto, just uh, by way of an example, even though we're in close proximity to residential um, communities, uh, there are large stretches of Main Street where we have, for example, five or six businesses that have closed, and, um, and we see the accumulation of ice and snow because no one's actually occupying those spaces anymore. Uh, what do we do about those spaces? How do we get enforcement? Because there's no, it's no longer as, as easy as um, relying on the shopkeeper to come out. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, there's two elements here. So on the private property side, so if there was like a parking lot or a step, that enforcement would be done by municipal licensing and standards. Um, and we require it to be removed by the property owner or occupant within 24 hours. With respect to the sidewalk, that would be done and forced by transportation services. Um, and 
I actually, uh, Andre should be on the line if he wants to speak specifically to sidewalk. Good afternoon. Uh, through the chair, yes. Uh, we would we would enforce sidewalk complaints uh, through through generally through three one one, and once the the period for for enforcement is usually after twelve hours after the snow has ceased, we would uh, we would react on a, co a complaint basis. And uh, Andre, just to to clarify, because in some of the communities, uh, especially that have. Uh, sort of like around the clock activity, around the clock pedestrian activity. Um, after 12 hours upon snowfall, if the snow has not been cleared, the ice has not been cleared, um, a, a member of the community, a resident can call 311. And then how long does it take for 311 anticipated until it is cleared, the snow and ice? Well, that, that can vary depending on the volume of, of complaints that we get. Uh, we usually give priority to first come, first serve, and again, it's reactionary. So it could be anywhere within uh, 24 hours, or it could be it could potentially even be days after that, depending on the volume of complaints. Okay, and uh, just uh, with respect to the, the the restrictions on when snow clearing should take place, um, the the. The, I guess the, the catalyst for this report um, and the intention of the report, is it to ensure clarity of, of uh, the, the, the obligations of the property owner so that everybody understands what is expected of them? Um, or is it a matter of wanting to update the, the bylaws uh, so that we can actually um, get more compliance? Um, what's the intention here? What are you driving at? So the intention of the report is to respond back um, from the committee directive, where they asked us to look at the feasibility of prohibiting snow clearing overnight on commercial properties if the commercial property is near a residential area. Um, as you know, because of the mixed use design of Toronto, um, most residential areas are near commercial properties. Um, so we've worked with transportation services and city planning and the accessibility office, and, and we have concerns that this would effectively ban overnight snow clearing. Um, staff do not support this, and we are providing um, a report to Infrastructure and Environment Committee to state that there are safety and accessibility concerns um, with this directive, and so we are providing an explanation of both. Okay, so essentially the, the report is to explain to um, the committee uh, that any any proposal to ban overnight snow clearing uh, would not be supported by staff. That's correct. Okay. And is besides the the noise factor and the, the operating of mechanical equipment, um, if you were to evaluate that um, uh, or weigh that against the 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 outcome, which is accessible. Uh, sidewalks or accessible uh, sort of uh, commercial spaces where people can navigate safely. If you have these two competing interests, one is the, the inconvenience of hearing noise operated from mechanical machinery overnight versus the inconvenience of, of, uh, of then not having accessible uh, commercial spaces, um, how, would, how, how would staff uh, speak to that issue if it was raised and in, in, in put forward um, in that manner? So staff would consider the noise complaint um, a nuisance concern, which we, we do take nuisance concerns seriously, but we do weight the safety and accessibility of residents um, higher than a, a nuisance issue. Um, we also are cognizant of the fact that um, most of the time these companies are trying to clear snow as quickly and as, as efficiently as possible. So although there is a nuisance concern, it should clear relatively quickly. Um, and also snowfall, um, it depends on the year. We haven't had too many um, events this year, but um, in past years there has been more. And again, we still don't think that outweighs um, the safety and accessibility of residents. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I have no further questions. Uh, let me just, uh, if I can ask to get the grid back on the screen, thank you. Are there any other members with questions? Uh, Liv, go ahead, please, and then followed by Wendy. Thank you, and, and thank you for your report. Um, I just have a quick one. Um, when these issues of competing needs come up, and I certainly sympathize with people who are 
who are dealing with noise, uh, but of course, accessibility is a priority. Um, when, it, when these kind of competing needs come up, sometimes it's helpful um, to have a communication strategy and more information. So I'm wondering, um, you've mentioned, you know, you've collected data on noise complaints or you're aware of them. Um, through 311 or otherwise, are you collecting information on the number of people who are submitting accessibility related complaints? Um, and um, is that something you're able to to share so that people understand um, a little bit more uh, about what's happening in their neighborhood and who's being impacted? Yes, a great question. So we actually don't collect noise complaints in relation to snow clearing because the noise bylaw exempts snow clearing. So um, we, we don't accept those. Um, that being said, we are aware um, from receiving complaints from residents or through counselor's offices um, about this issue. So far, we've received, I think, six complaints in re about snow clearing um, this year. And with respect to snow clearing in general, um, we do collect complaints about private property. And on average, we receive about 120 per year. And then obviously in a year that there's greater snowfall that has increased um, to upwards up to 400. Um, we haven't specifically looked at whether the complaint specifically noted accessibility. We would have to go back and do a manual search through the comments. Um, but we do know we get about 120 per year. I think that's thank you. That's helpful to know. I do think you you may not want to go back and do that, but going forward, I think whenever there's a complaint issue, it's always helpful. And for our committee, we always seek the data of what is accessibility based complaints and what is was other. Um, so I would encourage you uh, to take a look at that. Um, but yes, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Liv. Uh, Wendy, to to ask questions, please. Hi there, thank you also from me for the presentation. It's very interesting to consider these kinds of, um, I think as Liv said, competing rights. The My question is, um, are, are the complaints coming from like uniformly across the city? Are there sort of uh, hotspots where these complaints are more frequent? Um, and I guess I'm just wondering about it again in the context of how, how do you respond? So when those complaints are made, Currently, what kind of a response do people get? Um, and you know, thinking it. Two things: is it possible to look at? I'm sure that you have done this, but you know, the scheduling of those particular areas. If there are areas that are sort of more frequently um, coming up with these kinds of complaints, so that you're not doing that at night, or if there's a way to do it in the evening, or something like that. But also, just in terms of the the way that the responses are put to folks. If the question, or at least the issue of accessibility, is introduced at all, folks, when they make these complaints, as as a rationale for why you're doing the work that you do. So sorry, there's a bunch of mixed up questions there, but um, hopefully, hopefully you can discern what I mean <laughs> from that. No, of course, and I'll try to unpack, and then just let me know if I've missed something. Um, so the first part is the geographic location of complaints. Um, this specific directive is in relation uh, to uh, resident complaints around one commercial plaza. Um, so there was sort of um, a geographic component to this. Um, but in general, um, we would receive, if we receive complaints, they are typically across the city. Um, and then sort of next next part in terms of what MLS does when we've received noise complaints about snow clearing. Um, so the first part is typically education, and that would be um, there is an exemption, and the reason that there's an exemption is for safety and accessibility reasons. Um, we could also highlight the uh, two Toronto Municipal Code chapters that have time constraints for property owners and occupants to make sure that they clear snow uh, on time. Uh, then sort of as a best practice, we would try to do informal mediation and so specifically uh, in the area where this sort of um, noise issue occurred is like asking if um, the company could come at a different time of day if they could start on one side of the plaza uh, first and then move move to another side of the plaza just working with the, co with the company to try and see um, obviously there would be nothing sort of 
um, binding for the company. This would just be on their own goodwill. And because there's no bylaw infraction, we could not uh, follow up with enforcement. So this is when if our informal mediation wouldn't work, we would suggest that they try a formal mediation process through our community partner, and that's free for both the city and the participants. Uh, do you have any? Really helpful, thank you. Great, sorry, Wendy, I didn't mean to interrupt. Um, are there any other questions? Okay. Uh, seeing none, uh, members to speak. I will, okay, Wendy, please go ahead, please. I, I just wanted to say, uh, maybe it's just, you know, the requirement that some, that we say this, um, but, you know, the, the difficulties that people with disabilities have in the city in terms of traversing the sidewalks anyway, I think are quite well known. Um, and, you know, it, this situation, it sounds as though it's, it's a particular concern with one particular location that could lead to a ban across the city. And uh, that would be very unfortunate in terms of the, the uh, nighttime snow clearing. For people with disabilities, it would actually potentially result in an even more difficult time in getting out onto uh, the streets of Toronto than what we've seen so far. And I think anything that's going to move us into a situation that's worse than what we already have uh, should be um, strenuously fought against. So I think that, you know, the recommendation from the city staff that, that this is not a direction that you want to go down in terms of banning snow clearing overnight. Um, certainly in terms of my experience sitting on this committee and what I know about people with disabilities trying to use the sidewalks, which is already currently challenging uh, to add, you know, less snow removal to that would become even more of an issue. So I would support the staff recommendation here. Uh, thank you very much, Wendy, for your comments. Anyone else to speak? Sorry, I just don't have the, the <laughs> I don't have the grid in front of me. Um, be, <laughs> sorry, folks. Thank you. Uh, Glenn, yes, thank you. Uh, Glenn to speak, go ahead. Sure. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank the presenter. Um, it was informative and the questions you've answered thus far have only made that more fulsome. Um, to weigh in, I certainly um, agree uh, that the health and safety of people living with disabilities greatly outweighs annoyance. I mean, sure, I have been woken up by commercial snow plows in the middle of the night. It is annoying when you get woken up at 3 a.m. However, when people living with disabilities and seniors and people with toddlers and anyone carrying big and awkward things on the sidewalk have their health and safety impacted, that is a far greater weight of issue and weight of rights than a few people being woken up at an inconvenient time. That's all I have to say. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Glenn. Uh, anyone else to speak? Um, seeing none, um, I'll just take a, a couple minutes. Uh, number one is to move a motion. Um, and the motion is that the Toronto Accessibility Advisory Committee communicate its support to the Infrastructure and the Environment Committee for the staff's preliminary recommendations against prohibiting overnight snow clearing of commercial properties within 100 meters of residential areas. Um, it's, a very, it's very specific largely because that's what the staff report is going to be speaking upon. Um, and I know that the staff recommendations have not been tabled yet, so that's why I, that's why I, I, I outlined that as preliminary. In case it changes, um, obviously, uh, you'll have to come back to speak to us once again. Uh, but I just want to uh, lean very heavily in, in support of staff uh, and where you are landing right now with that decision. Um, I think that your approach is, uh, is very sound, uh, and obviously this is not a matter that can be um, you know, quickly undone, especially when there are 
um, I'm not even going to call it competing interests. I'm going to call it, you know, just there are some found, foundational rights matter that, that should not be overturned, um, and that is around accessibility, uh, making sure people have safe access. Um, we live in a city with all sorts of noises. I, I'm a downtown resident. Uh, is there any noise that doesn't come penetrating through the window, whether it's a siren or perhaps a, a snow plow or, um, you know, the, the rallies and marches that happen? And they are, like, literally um, around the clock. Uh, obviously, evening time, you want to sleep, and we want you to sleep. Everybody deserves a good night's sleep. But it cannot be at the, uh, at the price paid for uh, for those who really need to have access uh, so it's not a matter of inconvenience, it's a matter of obstacles that will uh, limit people's free mobility. And, uh, and I think that, uh, that your, your recommendations uh, deserve some sound support from our committee. Um, so I will leave my remarks there and thank staff. Um, I'm sorry that you had to even do this report, uh, to be quite honest. It sounds to me, you know, somebody wants to have a, their fair hearing at City Council and hopefully they will have that. But, um, but uh, I'm really encouraged that you're not interested in opening this up any further. Um, anyone to ask questions of the mover? Okay, uh, seeing none, then all those, then we just simply have the motion in front of you. All those in favor, if you can indicate your support. And any opposed, that carries. Uh, Jessica, thank you, keep up the good work. Okay, so we're heading on to item number two, which is actually our last item, uh, CAFE TO 2021 Accessibility Feedback. You're looking for that. Uh, we have a staff presentation from Jody Kalan, who's the Project Manager of Policy and Innovation Unit from the Transportation Services Depart Division. Um, Jody, hi Jody, we see you on the screen. When you're ready, just begin. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm excited to be here as a follow up to our last presentation to you in November about the CAFE TO program. My name is Jody Cowan. I'm a project manager with the Policy and Innovation uh, Unit, and the clerk the clerks is going to advance my presentation. So if we can have it up on the screen, please. Great, thank you. Uh, so throughout my presentation today, there's going to be several touch points for feedback. Uh, so I'll do my best to keep the presentation high level in order to ensure that we have enough time at the end uh, to discuss a number of these uh, uh, issues. And I think too that um, we'll talk a little bit about what we're planning for 2021 and the additional opportunities that not only this committee, but other um, you know, members of the public and the accessibility community will have to offer us feedback on the, pro on the program throughout the year. Okay, next slide, please. I think you can see it on the screen there. I think we'll, we'll go to slide two, please. Yeah, let me try again. Great. Excellent. Okay, so just a quick overview on CAFE TO, uh, which was a program that we rapidly deployed in 2020 to support the restaurant industry in Toronto, uh, who was adversely impacted by the pandemic related uh, restrictions. The program itself was built on uh, the council approved sidewalk cafes, parklets and marketing displays bylaw, otherwise known as chapter 742. And that's how I'll refer to it for the remainder of the presentation, which came into force in September, 2019. Now, chapter 742 uh, had, was the result of extensive consultation with the accessibility community. And the design guidelines that came out of that process were incorporated into the CAFE TO guidebook for operators. However, during a review of the 2020 program, which included feedback from the public in general, the accessibility community specifically, and of course, also through this committee and, and our own work, we identified that it, it, certainly additional enforcement and education is required to achieve better compliance with the guidelines, which we intend to address in 2021. 
Also, we're proposing several enhancements as far as educational materials are concerned in order to illustrate um, the importance of the design guidelines and some of the trickier pieces that will address accessibility issues. So the, the guidebook really is going to be quite enhanced from, from last year. And a lot of my presentation to today is going to discuss how we plan to do that and seek feedback from you on um, other things related to that. So next slide, please. So you'll recall in November, you uh, submitted a decision letter uh, that required us to develop accessibility guidelines and workshops on the Curb TO and Cafe TO program, which actually flowed through to City Council on February 5th. Uh, our City Council did approve our plans for Cafe TO and Curb TO in 2021. And, and just a quick word on Curb TO right now. Uh, at the moment, uh, the the curb lane pedestrian zones that are a part of the curb teal program are not winter compatible. So there are none in place at this moment. And at this time, we are not certain which elements might be restarted uh, after the winter season for Curtio. We're going to be consulting with our partners at Toronto Public Health on, on this item. So really my presentation today is, is focused on CAFE TO. Uh, as a result of that. So a reminder too that the three main things that we are working on with you now is uniform standards on the use of, the use of asphalt ramps, inspection and enforcement schedule, and standards of design and curb lane patios. And the reason why we wanted to come back uh, to you so quickly is because we anticipate that registration for CAFE TO will open at the end of February and the CAFE TO guidebook will be released at that time. So we wanted to have an opportunity to come and talk to you before that happened and identify as well that there are, um, you know, other opportunities to continue this conversation. And, and really, in a, in a way to simply put it, we did identify last year that there were challenges and operational reasons why CAFE TO didn't fully meet our collective accessibility goals. And this year, I want to assure you that accessibility will be a top priority and our goal is to continuously improve the program and really our appearance here today is the start of that work and I, I think that work will be ongoing and I really want to leave you today with an understanding that additional consultation opportunities will be available throughout the year. Next slide please. So, so briefly, um, CAFE TO 2021, as we presented to Council, um, will continue to operate as a temporary program this year. And we've forecasted a future report before the end of the year uh, on the feasibility of continuing the CAFE TO program based on the information that we gather this year, which will include um, a and a request for an appropriate staffing complement if the program does become permanent, a proposed financial model, including program fees, feedback from the accessibility community and other communities, as a matter of fact, since we uh, present uh, the deadline for this presentation uh, came up, we've had some additional motions moved by Council that ask us to consult with other specific communities as well. And then any proposed changes to Chapter 742, specifically related to CAFE location and administration. And on this side, just to let you know, there's a photo of one of our Curb Lane Cafe areas on Queen East last year. Next slide, please. So a, qu a couple of words about the 2021 guidebook, which is currently in development right now and will be informed by ongoing feedback from this community and others. We do intend on making it avail available at the end of February. But one thing I want to stress is that the CAFE TO guidebook is a dynamic document. It's a living document. It's not something that when we release it at the end of February, it won't change. So really, we can update anything in that guidebook um, as long as it uh, doesn't conflict with our safety criteria. And those updates can be subsequently enforced at any time throughout the CAFE season. So while we don't have a guidebook, a full guidebook for you to view now, I just want to be clear with you that when it is made publicly available, we do encourage a review um, of from this uh, committee, committee and others to let us know if there's anything that you, you want to provide feedback on. And again, just another point here that the design criteria that we are incorporating in CAFE TO is all embedded in Chapter 742. 
So we haven't changed any of the design criteria, although we do recognize that further education and enforcement is critical and, and we're and required to make sure that we ensure that we meet those criteria that are set out in Chapter 742. Next slide, please. So in, in 2020, just to highlight the particular items that we made clear in the guidebook, uh, particularly relating to cane detectable delineation, color contrast, visible entrances, and minimum pedestrian clearway. Um, we, you know, the rapid deployment of CAF ATO in 2020 did lead to some accessibility issues in the, in the right of way. And we, we do think that through increased education and enforcement for CAFE operators, as well as the proposing the several enhancements to the guidebook we're going to talk about now will assist us with these things. And really, 2020 was a significant learning opportunity for all of us. And there are operational reasons why this year we'll be able to deploy an improved project uh, program. We've got more time um, and, you know, we've got a, a better understanding of how to actively apply the lessons that we learned last year. And while there were some er errors made last year, certainly we're, we're confident that through some of the measures we're going to present to you today, we're going to get better, particularly in terms of receiving your feedback on the program parameters in real time. Next slide, please. So, um, further to uh, what we're talking about in terms of 2021 enhancements to the guidebook, just a, a highlight here again that what what we're proposing is additional education and enforcement and some increased illustrations and um, you know understanding for operators on key criteria like color contrast of fencing and delineation equipment, cane detectability, minimum pedestrian clearway requirements, and pedestrian clearway measurement information. And we're going to run through them now, and I'll hold an opportunity for feedback at the end of the presentation on these specific things. Next slide, please. Okay, so color contrast. This is a, a deficiency that we saw in the 2020 guidebook. We felt that uh, although we did identify that color contrast with fencing and delineation items was a requirement last year, and our enforcement officers did watch out for it, we felt that we didn't use the strongest language possible in last year's guidebook. So for 2021, we're, we're going to strengthen the requirement and the language associated with color contrast, and we're in the process right now of determining um, the percentage contrast and some, some color examples uh, that we will include in, in the guidebook as well. So you may have some feedback on, on this particular item, but we really want to provide some illustrative examples here to strengthen the text. So uh, for this piece, the color contrast piece, um, it's a really, really a strengthening of the language and, and adding some illustrative examples so the operators understand what we're telling them to do. Next slide. Cane detectability is another section uh, in 2020 where we were actually quite comprehensive, we feel, as far as uh, uh, ensuring that every element of Chapter 742 with respect to cane detectability was embedded in the CAF ATO guidebook. However, we, we do think that a continuation of the language, which um, I'll just review it here with you, which is that freestanding or self-supporting delineation items must not create a trip hazard or project into the pedestrian clearway, as well as the color contrast and the lower rail height measurements uh, for non-solid delineation elements of between 77 and 150 millimeters above the sidewalk surface, or planter boxes with a solid detectable base that are spaced no more than 0.3 meters apart, except for the accessible entrance. So we're, we're going to continue with that language, but we are going to add additional illustrative examples in the guidebook to increase operator understanding of this requirement. And the next slide, please. So here is a change uh, that we are proposing for 2021. And this slide has an image of a map with a border around a good portion of the downtown core. And for those of you who are familiar with Chapter 7422, you'll know that this map and an appendix in the, in the bylaw detailed a number of downtown streets where there is 
sidewalks that are five meters wide or greater. And in the creation of Chapter 742 originally, we uh, said that those streets have to have a minimum 2.5 meter pedestrian clearway. In 2020, in order to streamline registration, address the short application turnaround time, and ensure CAFE operators understood the importance of the min minimum pedestrian clearway in general, we opted to implement a citywide 2.1 meter minimum pedestrian clearway. Now we feel that we're in a position where operators have had some exposure to the program, they understand what the pe pedestrian clearway is, they understand the importance of it, and we're, we're saying that we are going to revert back to the original requirements in Chapter 742 for the streets that are listed in Appendix A of that document and, are, and um, uh, will go back to the cafe operators that are in these locations and provide them with some ed education that had they had some cafe elements that were out uh, farther in 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 terms of uh, having a 2.1 cl meter clearway, that we'll ask them to uh, pull them back for that 0.4 meters. There. Go to the next slide, please. The additional information with respect to the pedestrian clearway measurements, I think, is a direct example of an improvement um, as far as feeling that cafe operators are are ready to understand more details. Now, this is this one is a little bit more complicated. In 2020, we advised cafe operators to ensure that a minimum 2.1 meter clearway was maintained at all times, and we detailed language and illustrative diagrams associated with the clearway in that piece. Simultaneously with that, we ensured that all of our enforcement operators were actually trained on the um, comprehensive guidelines that were in 742 with respect to change of direction in the pedestrian clearway, as long as the measurements um, for obstructions, but we didn't include those details in the guidebook last year. This year, what we're proposing is quite an expanded section in the CAFE TO guidebook with additional guidance and direction on how to accurately measure the clearway. And that would be including specific instructions on, on how to measure for obstructions, for example. So an example of that would be um, if a person sitting on a bench, there's a minimum uh, dimensions of how to incorporate their feet and leg, legs on the bench. And we did not provide illustrative examples on how to do that last year, and this year we will. Um, same thing with the deviation, the degree deviation and the straight and clear path of travel. We're going to include specific information there. And again, we, we did train our officers to understand and be cognizant of these things in the path of travel with, and, and they in many cases required instantaneous compliance, but we didn't include specific information to this effect in last year's guidebook. And, and with specific relation to the deviation piece, um, we're going to include illustrations and measurement instructions to assist operators in understanding the importance of a straight path of travel. And we're gonna back that up with increased enforcement on this specific issue. So I imagine there'll be some questions about this at the end, um, but this is something that we think is going to be a, a great enhancement to the guidebook, particularly with respect to the actual measurement instructions and telling cafe operators how to position themselves in the sidewalk and do the measurements so that they can understand that degree, um, that, that they're not exceeding that degree change. So next slide, please. Another proposed uh, enhancement to the 2021 guidebook is that last year we didn't include any specific information for cafe operators about how to incorporate accessibility into their cafe areas. And this is a, a piece where we'd really like some feedback from you today. Um, what we'd like to propose is a, is a brand new section in the guidebook that details uh, the choices that cafe operators can make that will increase accessibility in their cafe areas. Some potential topics that we've identified could include accessible furniture choices. We know there was issues with cafe operators perhaps only allow only offering picnic tables, for example, as a as a furniture choice. Accessible seating arrangements, ensuring that there's the appropriate use of the space around the curb ramps, potentially advertising accessible washroom facilities, and and some you know we we can build this out. 
um, as much as we want. The other thing that we thought we'd do this year as well is work with economic development and culture to include accessibility focused newsletter articles for cafe operators throughout the cafe season. So that we're, we're continually um, addressing this throughout the year to keep it top of mind for cafe operators in the business community so they understand the importance of it and it's not something that they just do at the beginning and then slowly over time they um, you know, make adjustments that don't uh, address our accessibility goals. The next slide, please. This and, and this further to that, what we'd like to do this year um, is increase the promotion of information about CAP ATO generally and specifically about accessibility issues. Last year, the program was new. Um, we had to focus our communication efforts on ensuring that restaurant and bar understood, uh, operators understood uh, you know, stream had streamlined and fast access to critical information related to the, their participation in the program. But this year, we feel that we have more time and opportunities to use our social media accounts and other communication outreach channels to disseminate specific information about accessibility throughout the year for not only just for cafe operators, but for BIA coordinators, for members of the public as well. So you may also have some additional feedback on, on this. So I'd like to highlight this as a touch point for, for feedback at the end of the presentation. Next slide, please. Okay, so I'd like to move on now to design standards for curb lane cafes. So away now from the guidebook specifically and on to more information about our curb lane cafes. And starting with a list of the location restrictions uh, where curb lane cafes cannot be placed, which we will continue in 2021. 20, so last year and this year, accessible parking areas, wheel trans stops, and accessible boarding zones are not locations where we will consider placing a, a curb lane cafe. And this is in re addition to restrictions for cafes on the sidewalk as well with respect to their proximity to the pedestrian curb clearway. The other thing, which I mentioned in November as well, that we will not accommodate streetcar stop relocations for cafes in order to ensure that their accessible loading ramps will, are not blocked. So these uh, tenants will continue in 2021. Next slide, please. A significant program enhancement for CAFE TO 2021 is permission for CAFE operators to install a deck or a platform or CAFE area if they meet the design criteria noted in Chapter 742. So we're, we're confirming those details now, um, but you'll see in the picture noted, noted on this slide uh, a built deck, uh, which is flush with the sidewalk, and that's a key criteria. Decks and platforms are required to be built with surfaces level with the sidewalk, and they must be compliant with the standards for decks, platforms, and ramps set out in both the AODA and the Ontario Building Code. Next slide, please. Another enhancement, which we touched upon last time, um, we installed 44 public parklets parklets and BIAs last year, and unfortunately, supply chain issues limited the ability for us to offer the intended variety of furniture choices for those locations. And because of those issues, we were only able to purchase Adirondack chairs for the public parklet. This year, with the lead time, we are proposing purchasing accessible picnic tables for BIA-supported public parklet areas, and we're already hearing from BIA coordinators that this is a preferred furniture choice in some of their locations. Next slide, please. Okay, curb ramps. And I know this will be a specific touch point for feedback at the end of the conversation. So um, I'm, I'm highlighting that. And I, I just wanna point out here, the image on this slide shows a ramp that was installed in a curb lane closure last year. And it illustrates both a ramp that is not acceptable and a key learning from our operations last year. And I can tell you with certainty that we won't see this type or size of ramp again this year in 2021. Last year, we installed 379 asphalt curb ramps in the Cafe Tio areas, and we will continue to install 
asphalt curb ramps in areas where the operator is not planning on installing a deck or platform. The enhancements we're proposing for 2021 include, and this is a key thing and something that really limited us last year, we're going to install the curb ramps at the precise moment that the curb lanes are closed. So that would mean that they would go in prior to the placement of furniture by cafe operators. Last year, just given the speed of the rollout and the desire for the cafe operators to get into the spaces as soon as possible, we didn't have an opportunity to align that the way that we should have. So this year, that's a big improvement that we're proposing. When the lanes are closed, the asphalt ramp will be installed right away. So there won't be a, a back and forth uh, with respect to the furniture that will already be in the location. The other thing is um, we, we do agree that a uniform curb ramp design and installation methodology is required. We'll move on to the next slide, please. So the technical specifications for the curb ramps that we are uh, wanting to move forward with is really related to the width of the curb lane that is reserved for cafe to, cafe operations. And the, the width of the curb lane does not provide enough space for an asphalt curb ramp with a one to 10 running slope, as well as the necessary landing space at the bottom of the curb ramp. Therefore, we require a steeper asphalt curb ramp for the temporary CAFE TO program. And the specifications that we're proposing takes that limitation into consideration. And those specifications are, a one to six running slope. So for a standard curb height of 150 millimeters, this will result in a one meter long ramp. The, meter, the ramp will be one meter wide. There will be flared sides with a one to three side, side slope minimum and a width of 0 0.3 meters each. The ramp edges will be um, painted with a contrasting color. Gen generally, we think yellow and, and non-slip as well. And the proposed turning space of 1.525 meters at the bottom with a view to enlarge this space wherever lane widths allow. So the average curb ramp will be one meter long and 1.6 meters wide after accounting for the side slopes, but not accounting for the landing space. And, and we feel that this ramp size is the most generous that we fit in the space that we have. So next slide, please. And, and moving on now to enforcement. So I, I mentioned earlier in the presentation, we, we understand that enforcement and education is a critical component of this work. And our new strategic approach for 2021, we think will address a lot of these issues. We're going to continue to encompass a two-pronged approach. So this is similar to last year. There were complaint-driven investigations and proactive patrols. So proactive patrols where, where officers would patrol an area that was saturated with cafes and ensure compliance on a regular basis. Municipal licensing and standards and transportation services are currently working together on a joint enforcement strategy. And, and that includes determining proposed schedules for that proactive patrol work. Um, a strategic approach with enforcement will allow officers to focus on accessibility concerns, ensuring cafe operators have successfully registered. We did identify last year that many issues are with operators that are not official participants of the program. So we don't have an interface with people who haven't successfully registered with us. Those who have receive updated guidelines if they're if there are any, and, and just a general communications with us. And, and those who just put tables and chairs on, this, on the street don't have that. So we're, we're gonna take a different approach with those cafe operators and make sure that they get registered with the program. And then increased enforcement action for cafe operators that aren't meeting the cafe TO requirements. Next slide, please. A few proposed improvements to tell you about. Um, we think increased and focused enforcement resources scheduled in peak cafe operation windows, so the evenings and weekends will assist. We're going to augment all the training materials and augment training opportunities for officers, including ongoing monthly training sessions to ensure that emerging issues are communicated and addressed between the two divisions. Uh, we're going to refresh the literature that officers distribute to CAFE operators that illustrate CAFE TO requirements, particularly focusing on accessibility issues. 
We uh, will heighten our enforcement strategy for accessibility issues in particular, um, especially in, in relation to encroachments into the pedestrian clearway, the presence of cane detectable delineation items, and another focus on the deviations. And of course, we'll prioritize proactive patrols in areas with high volumes of cafes and with known compliance issues. Next slide, please. So complaints, uh, this is something that we're, uh, we wanna ensure that members of the public generally understand how to submit complaints. Um, we were surprised to hear about some of the complaints last, that we talked about last time uh, we were at the committee and we, we wanna make sure that there's open lines of communication with us to submit complaints. And some of the proposals that we um, have include some CAFE TO communications campaigns that will include information about how to advise us about issues um, that are being experienced with CAFE operators or with other program concerns increased promotion of our communication methods, new and enhanced scripts for 311 customer service re representatives, and an improved complaint distribution for enforcement officers and staff. And the next slide, please. So, so feedback opportunities, this one is important. Um, and I've mentioned this at the start of the presentation, but um, it's important enough to talk about it again. We understand that the accessibility community would like to be able to provide ongoing feedback on the CAF ATO guidelines and concerns related to the program. And we definitely wanna ensure um, that your experiences with the program can be directly shared with us. And as we move throughout this year to get to uh, the next report to council about CAF ATO, we wanna continue to work with TAC and with other accessibility stakeholders continually evaluate this temporary program, investigate design improvements throughout the year, year and, and make recommendations for potential permanent implementation in 2022 and beyond. And, and while I'm, I hope that we'll be invited back to TAC to, to talk to you again in this environment, we also know that um, there are benefits to having a more workshop related environment and we do intend on having those those different types of stakeholder engagement sessions with you and with the public in general and, and with other communities that have an interest in CAFE TO as well. So essentially what we're, we're, we're going to start pulling the pieces together on a comprehensive consultation strategy and you'll certainly be um, informed and your feedback will be incorporated on how you think we should best do that. And then the final slide, please. So, and, and this would be the opportunity. I'm really looking forward to your questions and your feedback. I know this is a lot of information to take in and we're moving quickly, of course, with CAFE TO, but um, just to reiterate that accessibility concerns really are of paramount importance to us this year. And we wanna make sure that we're doing everything that we can get it right, not only for our operations, for the temporary program, but so that we're moving in the right direction for the future as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jody, uh, for your 10-minute presentation. Um, we were the you were the last item on the agenda, so we. But also, I knew that you had a lot to uh, to give back to the committee to reflect upon. Um, so, thank you very much for your presentation. And I know there are most likely some questions. Uh, I will just uh, take a look at the grid and to see if anybody has questions of staff right now. Uh, starting with Liv, go ahead, please. I really want to commend you on a very thorough report, and I think you you have uh, definitely taken into account a lot of uh, what we brought to your attention, and I really appreciate that. Uh, it's a lot to take in, and I'm thinking of how business owners will take all of this in, and I'm wondering um, whether you've considered, as part of your communications plan, making a short video specific to accessibility or something that's that's maybe easier to process than um, all of the, the guidelines um, in the guidebook. Um, so that's my, my first question. Uh, no, but that's a great idea. And we'll certainly talk to our communications people about what's possible. We agree there is a lot of information here. Um, well, you know, for us, it's, 
it's kind of packaged nicely, but for cafe operators who have a lot going on in terms of understanding, I do agree that there may be um, some benefits to finding another way to um, help them understand this information. We are going to be having targeted information sessions with the business community, and that's another opportunity for us to, to put a few things out there, but I, your feedback is very gratefully received, and we'll do some investigation to find out how we might do that. Um, I think also uh, framing this as a question, I guess with the nature of the, the rollout last year um, where um, some business owners were very attentive to the guidelines you put out, others were, it was a little more Wild West feel just because of the nature of a brand new program. Um, for, for folks who, who did have more of that relationship to the program uh, where it was a little bit chaotic, um, I'm just wondering, you know, as this this may become a permanent program, which is very exciting, um, how you how you can kind of shift that tone from this being like more of a pop up, temporary, uh, where there's maybe more wiggle room to something that's actually very clearly delineated. Yeah, that's a good, great question. I think this year we're going to look at those locations for more of an enforcement and, a, and an education lens and then we'll have to consider um, how we move forward in 2022 which is really a good portion of the work that we're going to do this year to get ready for our report to council by the end of the year what what will we require in the future so this is a great that's a great question for us to move towards when we do a more comprehensive consultation in the summer Wonderful. And just um, one more thought, and I, I'm sure this will be echoed by my colleagues, but I think um, the issue of complaints and that kind of uh, complaint based uh, complaints that trigger enforcement. Um, I do. Um, I would like to know a little bit more about how you're going to get the word out to people that this is something that they can complain about. Because um, we, we heard from a lot of we hear the complaints at our at our agencies um, through community, but I don't think that they all reach government because the mechanism um, wasn't clear to people. So I'm I'm just um, wanting to know a little bit more about um, what kind of communications we can put in place to make it clear that oh, if if this happened to you or if you experience this, this is the right way to to express your concern. Noted, yes, and, and that's a, a, a great point. One of the motions that was moved at Council um, actually asks us to, to create a who, who does what guide because there's quite a number of divisions who have a role to play in, in uh, CAF ATO beyond transportation services and municipal stand, licensing and standards, that you, the, the players that you might expect. And 311 is one of those partners, as well as our strategic communications lead. So we're going to work together on a comprehensive communication strategy. Um, and, and those pieces, we're going to start pulling them together now um, as far as the interface with the, the program is concerned. Yeah, so we don't have, I don't have a four firm answer for you now, but granted, this is something, this is a deficiency that we recognize as well. And we want to make sure that people understand how best to communicate, not only specific issues if they see an encroachment into the clear way, but just general feedback about the program outside of our consultation strategy. That's great. I, I want to commend you and your whole team. I think you've really come back uh, to us with something quite robust and it's clear you've done consultation. So, I want to thank you and just uh, just urge you that when you do collect any feedback or complaints, it's it's really helpful to separate out what's an accessibility complaint versus what's a different type of complaint. Noted. Thank you, uh, Jody. Jody, thank you for your answers and Liv for your question. Uh, Wendy, to question next. Is there any other member who wants to ask questions? Uh, Wendy, and then Michelle. Thank you. Go ahead, Wendy. Thank you for that presentation, Jody. I think it's great to see all of the uh, improvements and the kind of greater integration of accessibility in terms of the materials for the program. So I really do think that's fantastic. Um, I wanted to ask you specifically about a point that you raised around consultation. And it's something that I think we talked about previously uh, at the TAC too. And it is that you, You've said that you're going to uh, be looking at opportunities for consultation with the TAC and with the community 
And I just wonder if you have anything else to say on when that would be happening or how that would be happening. And I'm just specifically thinking about, you know, at least something, uh, at least something midway through the season to be able to check in with the community on, you know, are things going okay or, or are there things that really are are happening here that we need to address in a timely fashion? So do you have any additional thoughts or um, information on what that consultation strategy might look like? Sure. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're at the point where we need uh, to have put a little bit more inputs into what a strategy looks like because after council, we did our, our consultation requirements have gone up. And so we're in the process of understanding exactly who we need to con consult with and when. I agree, we need uh, multiple touch points with various communities and the accessibility community included. And, and we think that um, what would be of great benefit is um, a more facilitated approach. Uh, as far as the consultations are concerned. And I think probably more than one between now and the creation of the program, I, I think you're right. Um, uh, having an opportunity to provide feedback directly to us once the program gets up and running, which will be earlier this year. Um, we, we do think that um, as long as public health reg um, regulations permit outdoor dining, uh, we think the curdling cafes will be installed for May. So we've got a bit more lead time. Last year, they weren't really going in place until July. So we can um, have the program run for, let's say, four to six weeks and then have an opportunity for a consultation, a facilitated consultation um, with a number of uh, stakeholders and and then look again for another consultative experience as we get closer to the end of the operations of ca the CAFE TO program and more into the planning for the future. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, next person to ask questions would be Michelle. Thank you, Councillor Wongtam. Thank you, Jody, for your presentation and echoing what Liv and Wendy have said. Uh, it's great to see that you've really incorporated our feedback from when you joined us last time. So thank you. Um, my question is just around the guidebook specifically. So I'm curious if it has more information about the enforcement specifically, particularly for people that, like you said, operators that are just simply not part of the program. I'm just wondering if it's a warning base or how that might work and if that's maybe further illustrated in the guidebook. And then I guess a second part of that question around the guidebook is, uh, I get it's tricky with timelines and everything. I'm wondering if in future it's possible for our committee and other stakeholders to see that before it goes to business owners or live. Like I understand it's a living document. And we can give our feedback once it's uh, out there, but I wonder if in future there's a way to have it so that it could potentially come to us first for our feedback and then go live, if that makes sense. Right. Okay. So in answer to your first question, actually, one of the things we did with the council report this year is sort of strengthen the provisions for enforcement with respect to um, Chapter 742 and the ability for us to actually remove cafe materials if it comes to that. So that's something that's a um, just further highlighted and we're we're working at incorporating language in the guidebook that identifies to cafe operators that repeated offenses that can, can risk their participation in the program. That was in the guidebook last year as well. We didn't have um, anybody that really was, um, you know, someone that we would maybe refer to as a bad operator. The vast majority of complaints were rectified at the moment that the enforcement officer advised the, the operator what violation, what they were in violation of. And we do expect that prim primarily to continue, but but noted that the the language is there now. Council has, has added some additional provisions that increase our ability to take swifter and more decisive action if required. And then in response to your question about the guidebook, under understood the, the timing issues now. And I think um, what will happen the next time is there may not be a guidebook, so to speak, because I think the vision would be that we would re be returning to a bylaw that may have an application guide associated with it in order to sort of unpack some of that, um, you know, trickier language. And that's one of the benefits of actually having the guidebook compared to um, a cafe operator 
what they would have had to do in Chapter 742. We, 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 the guidebook actually extrapolates, extrapolates into plainer language some of those requirements, has an opportunity to put in a diagram so, under, so someone can understand uh, a, how to measure the pedestrian clearway and things like that. So there is some benefit, I think, to having a publicly accessible plain language guide. Um, and we would, we would work to offer more opportunities to provide consultation in the future. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, Michelle, thank you. Anyone else who has questions for staff? Okay, I'm not seeing any more hands. Um, uh, Jody, I just have a couple of quick questions and I'll try to be succinct. Um, with respect to um, complaints and then possibly the, the request for appeals, um, and uh, I know that uh, you have some very clear criteria of what space would uh, allow for 2.1, 2.5 clearway. Um, is there an appeal process for business operators who get denied at the first, uh, first passing? If they don't have the clearway? That's correct. Uh, at this point, no. If a, cafe, if a cafe operator on the sidewalk doesn't have the appropriate clearway, they just they simply won't receive approval to participate in the in the program. Now, there is a small it's called a small frontage cafe. You might be familiar with it on the sidewalk, and that's a, a cafe. If you can imagine a bench in front of an ice cream shop, for example, or maybe a small bistro table, there are keen detectability requirements for those installations, but they can only be 0 0.8 meters wide. Those are the only cafe types that don't require um, registration with the city at this time. There is a, there is a curbside standing cafe uh, that you can put in the furnishing zone, but we're not permitting those this year because we anticipate that public health regulations will be the same as last year and people were not permitted to stand and consume food and drink. So. Um, those would be the only cafe types, and I think that we're going to increase our enforcement uh, as far as the cafe operators who have not registered. Um, if they don't have the clear way for a 0.8 um, you know, meter deep cafe, then they, can't, they really can't put anything out. Okay. Uh, thank you. And is it the intention of staff to... Um... Is, is it a delegated authority at this point, and will it remain a delegated authority? So therefore, it doesn't necessarily come to council, or will it be packaged up and come to council uh, in a group setting? So therefore, here's, here's, here's 400 listings. Uh, they're all going to be approved by council. How, how do you uh, foresee the pathway to approval here? So at this point, we, uh, the general manager of transportation services, has delegated authority to approve cafe locations in terms of expanded new and uh, dining opportunities on both the sidewalk and the curb lane, with the exception of cafes that are located on local streets. We also refer to them as flankage cafes. Because of their proximity to residential areas, we do require councillor support for them. Uh, previously, those are cafes that would have been approved by community council. So in lieu of the community council process this year, then uh, support from the local councillor can permit that operator to have a flankage cafe on a local road. But uh, other than that, the delegated authority rests with the general manager of transportation services for cafe locations. Okay, thank you. Um, and with respect to um, the workshop style feedback, and I, I really appreciate that you were, uh, you, you spoke to that. Can you elaborate a little bit further? Because obviously we're sitting in, uh, in a virtual setting. Uh, we're not touching the materials. We, we don't get to see, sort of feel the, uh, the slopes or perhaps um, even the materials, the tactility and all that stuff. Um, what does a workshop um, environment look like that will allow you to have sort of a hands-on feedback? Um, and, uh, and is that something that you're planning to um, uh, to create the forum for, the opportunity uh, for feedback in 2021, or is this something you're looking forward to in 2022? Great question, and a difficult one to answer at this time, of course, given the restrictions that we're all still currently under, and the, the timing of, of, our, of, of when we think we're going to be rolling the cafes out. I don't anticipate that we'll be able to have in-person meetings by the time that happens, but I think that 
Um, the consultative process that we're going to employ this year, um, much like what I mentioned in, during Wendy's question, I think we'll have an opportunity early on in the program to gather feedback on how the rollout is, is happening. And then for um, the plans for 2020, uh, we may be in a better position to have a more of a workshop uh, feel and uh, if there's, um, you know, a tactile references with respect to the ramps or something like that, it's probably more um, feasible to consider doing something uh, later on in 2021. Okay, thank you very much, Jody. I have no further questions. Uh, just the last call for questions, anyone? Just taking one more look. No, nope, you all look very satisfied. Okay, um, then uh, members who wish to speak. Any members who want to add their voice to remarks? No? Okay, so um, seeing none, oh, did I hear a, a sigh of ready to speak? No? Okay, so um, thank you very much, members. Um, you know, when members don't necessarily want to take the opportunity to speak, um, it's generally good news. <laughs> so I'm going to lean into that. Uh, Jody, I, I have a motion. I'm going to place this on the screen uh, for the members uh, that the trial advice. Accessibility Advisory Committee communicated support to the Executive Committee for consideration with the next staff report on CAFE TO for the enhanced 2021 CAFE TO guidebook and its ongoing refinements through consultation with persons with living with disabilities. Um, and I just want to say congratulations. Um, I, I haven't spoken to all the members, obviously, because we're all sitting in virtual spaces. Um, but from what I have seen, um, based on uh, your presentation today, uh, I can tell that you listened. And I, I recognize that transportation services uh, was uh, probably very correctly criticized for rushing it, and we recognize the limitations because you were trying to respond to a pandemic. Um, but I think also uh, you deserve great credit, and transportation services deserves great credit for really hearing this community um, and incorporating a lot of those changes uh, into the 21 refinements. Um, I think also this committee and this community also deserves uh, some recognition because they were also incredibly patient. They recognized that there was uh, just everybody was moving at lightning speed, um, and they knew that this 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 past summer um, there were new obstacles that seemed to be thrown up all over the place. Uh, and I've heard from friends and, and neighbors who were just number one wildly supportive of the program, but at the same time uh, they did run into significant challenges um, that rendered them almost unable to leave some of their apartment or get through the tight navigated areas of the city. Um, and so I just want to say thank you for, for really being able to hear us, uh, not being defensive, and, uh, and recognizing that it's so critically important that we work together to refine what I believe is going to be an ultimately successful legacy project for the city. Um, like anything else, 2022 will give us an opportunity to further uh, dig into those refinements, and we are, I am certainly very grateful to know that you're willing to come back to this committee to show us what you've learned out of the 2021 uh, rollout so we can continue to work with you to further enhance and support this program. Um, and, uh, and I'll just leave my remarks there, and I just want to say thank you. Uh, anyone else to speak? No? Okay, you guys are... There, everyone's good. Um, so, Jody, thank you. Uh, all those in favor of the motion, please indicate your support. Any opposed, contrary minded, seeing none, that passes. Um, so, folks, that brings us to the end of our meeting, um, but don't go away yet. I do have one more motion, and that motion uh, is to excuse those who are not able to join us today. Uh, I move that the Toronto Accessibility Advisory Committee excuse the absence of Miranda Frey, uh, Stephanie Marancini Lee, and Michael McNeely from the February 10th, 2020 Toronto Accessibility Advisory Committee meeting. Uh, all those in favor of the motion, please indicate your support. Any contrary minded, seeing none, uh, that carries. Thank you. Um, our next meeting, folks, and I'll just finish on this note. We have a very big meeting at our next TAC meeting. It's a special called meeting. We have one item on the agenda, and that will be to review um, the e-scooter uh, uh, potential rollout and program. Um, but we also wanted to use that meeting largely to solicit uh, feedback from the community, uh, recognizing that sometimes uh, the community may not be able to get to all the standing committees. And when those standing committees meet, they usually have about 20, 30 items on the agenda. The only thing we're here to do on February the 25th is to listen to the community, 
uh, as they give us their feedback on e-scooters and the e-scooter uh, program. Um, so the meeting is going to start at 9.30, so please be prompt. Uh, pack your lunch. Uh, we don't know how long that meeting will be. Uh, generally, our meetings, of course, are no longer than three to four hours, um, but, we, but we just don't know at this point in time. So be prepared for what could be a very long day, uh, and I'll look forward to seeing all of you there. Please spread the word to your community and network that we want them to come out and to speak to us at that committee meeting.